All right, so as I mentioned this morning, uh, if you were here this morning, my sermon this evening is going to be about prayer, and the title of my sermon is Pray and Be Heard. So uh, we're going to look at various places in Scripture that talk about praying and, and basically how you can be very effective with your, with your prayer and make sure your prayers are being heard by the Lord. And I figured it was, you know, this a month uh, of March, we're doing the prayer challenge. So as long as we're going to be praying, let's make sure we're doing, you know, getting the most out of our prayer. And we start here in Matthew chapter 7, as where, we, where we have a great promise. And this is one of the main reasons why we pray to begin with. If you want to look down there in verse number 7, the Bible says, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. So before we even continue on this passage, you know, Jesus is saying here, look, ask. And that's what, what it means to pray is to ask. That's all it means. The word pray is you're asking something. So we're asking the Lord for things. And when we go to God in prayer, we have requests. We want God to do things for us. We want God to help us with things. Well, what this, this great uh, passage here is saying, look, ask, and it's going to be given to you. So we know that we have a loving father here as he continues on and explains this a little bit further in verse number nine. Or what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Right? Your, your son comes to you. He's like, dad, I'm hungry. Can you, can you, do you have any food for me? I want to eat. I'm, I'm really hungry. They're like, yeah, here's a rock, kid. Get out of here. <laughs> like, what, what father's going to do that? No one's going to do that. Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? It's like, yeah, here's a snake. Have fun with that one. If ye being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him? Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. And that verse is going to come up again a little bit later. But if, you know, he says, if you being evil, what we're all sinners, none of us is perfect. Yet we still know how to be able to take care of our children, right? Children ask you for something. Uh, of course, you're going to be there to give it to them. Now, we know that this doesn't just apply carte blanche across the board. It's just well, anything that you ask, you're going to get it as if God is a genie in a bottle that just says, okay, I'm granting you three wishes. So whatever you want, I'm just going to do it for you. No, it's a little bit more involved than that, right? God's not going to just give us things that are not good for us or things that are just openly sinful, just like he's not going to be like, okay, here you go. He loves you the same way that you love your children and you're not going to just be giving them a, a, a scorpion or something that's going to like hurt them or potentially kill them when they just come to you asking for good things. Like, hey, dad, can, can you feed me? I'm kind of hungry. Well, of course, I'll, I'll give you some food. So we have this great confidence that we have a heavenly father. Hey, you're born again. You're a child of God. You're in God's family. I mean, the Bible even says that Jesus isn't ashamed to call us brethren, which is a quite, quite the honor, right? It's, it's awesome to even think that we could ever be thought of as being family, as being children, as being brethren with the holy, with God, Right? And that, but that, those are these endearing terms that he's, he's given to us and bestowed upon us that we should take to heart when we now think about, oh, I have a need. Oh, I want to do this or do that. So we could go to our Heavenly Father and ask him for those things. And we have, as you can see in the announcements, we have that list of people who, a whole bunch of people who have a, not, a lot of needs, a lot of problems in their life. And you know what? Those are all good things that, that we could ask the Lord to help with, especially things that are kind of out of our control in many instances or many circumstances where, hey, we've got these diseases or we have these other issues coming up or medical problems, whatever. God, we need your help with this. Can you please help us? These are all great things to ask for. And we know um, that God is willing to help us and is there to want to uh, help us to succeed in our Christian life. Now, of course, that being said, there are going to be times where the answer that we're looking for doesn't come uh, the way that we might want it to or expect it to. And I'll tell you this much, there's multiple reasons why that might happen. Okay, so we're going to look at different passages and turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 21. But 
just by mouthing words to the Lord, that's not going to guarantee an answer to prayer at all. You, you have, there, there's, there's other conditions that are laid out in Scripture, and we kind of look at this as a whole collectively to see, oh, okay, if I, if I really want my prayers to get heard, we, I need to have this, and I, and I ought to have that, and I ought to do things this way, and I ought to make sure that, that I'm, I'm kind of lined up in all these various areas to really make sure that God's hearing me. Okay, now the first thing that we're going to look at here is in Matthew chapter 21, verse number 21. The Bible reads, Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, if ye have faith and doubt not, ye shall not only do this which is done to the fig tree, but also if ye shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, it shall be done. And all things whatsoever ye shall ask in prayer, believing you shall receive. So when we pray to God, it's important to also make sure that you have faith and you trust and believe that God is capable of doing those things, right? And that he will do those things, that, that you go to the Lord in faith, even if it's something that is completely naturally unreasonable or impossible, right? That's why he brings up, hey, you could say unto this mountain, be thou removed. Because that's something that to us would just be like ridiculous. Like no one could do that. Of course, that's ridiculous. That's not going to happen. Well, no. When we have impossible uh, objects in front of us, impossible situations, impossible, like, like there's, I don't even see any way out of this, Lord. I don't know how you could possibly make, make me to be able to get through this situation. It's completely impossible. Well, just believe that God is able to help you and God is able to get things done. I mean, someone could have some, some deathly disease, for example, or just like, look, no one can do anything to help them. You know what? God can. Amen. God is almighty. Remember, it's God almighty that we serve. It's, it's the Lord of hosts. It's God who is all powerful that is able to do anything. You know, when Moses powered the Red Sea, do you think that was the power of Moses? No, of course not. Right? It's the power of God. And, and all the great miracles that we see, we've seen children had their, or mothers had their children received up from the dead. You read through Hebrews 11. That's our Bible memory passage. And there's lots of examples in there of great men of faith that were able to use the power of God to do great things and great works for the Lord. But all of these things you ask in faith. Turn, if you would, to James chapter 1. We see another example of this, of the admonition to have faith when you ask. When you're going to God in prayer, trust and know God is capable of doing anything. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. I mean, even when God was promising to Abraham the child of promise, right? Isaac. They were already past age even. Like he did that before, but then even later on, it's like, what? Sarah here is like, what? I'm going to give birth in my old age? Like it's already past the time of women with her. It's like, you know what? Don't limit God. And oftentimes in our prayers, people maybe even unwittingly will limit God. And, I, and I'll recommend this to you, that when you pray, God is capable of all things. You don't just have to pray in the confines of what you think is possible. Well, God, if you can just do this, if you can just work with the man that's treating so-and-so, right? And, and I'll give you an example like this. You know, Because I, I, I will frequently pray like this because I want to pray everything that I could possibly think of to pray for someone that, that will be helpful. Right? So I will pray when my wife has surgery that God will give the surgeon some skill of his hand to be able to do things properly. But I don't just pray for the things that would be like, well, that's still within the realm of like normalcy of, of, of course, you know, well, she's going to go to surgery and they're going to have to have skill and do this stuff. I'm going to pray for God to miraculously still heal and just make sure everything goes really well and to, to do things that only he can do. And just come up with everything I could think of that's going to be like, hey, if you can do this, Lord, because you can do anything, then I'm asking you to do this too, and I'm asking for that, right? We ask for things, but without doubting, right? We have faith that, that it would not be unreasonable for God to answer a prayer in something that is just extremely difficult or hard or what we would seem to be as impossible, And that, that, I mean, you could just probably continue. I could stay in here all night and think of all the things that we might think to be impossible that are not impossible with God. 
They're only impossible the things of this world. So we need to be able to pray and ask things in faith. Here we see in James chapter 1, verse number 5, the Bible says, If any of you lack wisdom, is, it, now, is there anyone here that would say they lack wisdom? <laughs> okay, look. Yeah, I mean, I, I hope we can all have the, the humility to say, I, you know what, I think I'm lacking some wisdom in my life. I want more. It doesn't mean you don't know anything, but I'm, I'm lacking. I, I could use some more. You know what? There's areas of scripture that I don't understand. You know what that means? I need, I need wisdom. <laughs> I need to understand some more. I don't have it all figured out. I need some wisdom. Yeah, I lack wisdom. But you know, you know what's good about this, though? Look, if any of you lack wisdom, guess what? Listen up. Let him ask of God. That giveth to all men liberally. Now, this isn't that bad liberal that you might be thinking about politically. This is good liberal. This is, this is being really free with really good things like giving wisdom to people. He says he gives, he gives liberally. He's going to give you, you know, a lot. He's not going to hold back. He's not going to just be stingy with, well, I'll give you a little bit of wisdom, but not too much, right? No, he gives liberally uh, to all men and upbraideth not. Look at this, and it shall be given him. Verse 6, so follows up, but... Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. Hey, you want to get wisdom? Ask God. God will give you wisdom. But ask in faith. Don't, don't be doubting. Well, I don't know. I mean, I don't think. I... Well, maybe. Maybe I'll give it a shot, I guess. Okay, God, can I have some wisdom? You know, like, look, don't do that. Don't be wavering either. Don't be thinking like, well, maybe he can, maybe he can't. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavereth. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Right? I mean, there, there's a very clear example of someone that might ask something and just not get their prayer answered. Why? He says, don't think, he's not going to get anything of God. Amen. Why? Because he's wavering around. He's not solid. He's not, he's not trusting and having that faith just that God can do any of this stuff and I'm going to trust him completely that he could give me this wisdom. And I don't care if you've been diagnosed with ADD or any other type of learning disability. The Bible says that God will give wisdom to all men liberally. Amen. And you just got to ask and you ask in faith. Amen. And don't think you've got something, well, I don't know if God... Well, yeah, you waver, then God's not going to give it to you. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Uh, to flip over to James chapter 4, it's also important when we're praying to pray for the right things. As I mentioned earlier, God's not just going to give you everything. That, that statement in Matthew 7, asking shall be given to you, was not containing just every possible thing under the sun, no matter what it is. So you said, well, I asked God for a million dollars and I totally believe he could do it, <laughs> right? I mean, I just, I just asked. He says, ask, you shall receive. So what's up, God? How come I don't just have a million dollars sitting right in front of me right now? Look, it, that's, not how, that's not how it works. It's not how it works. And we could, we could see from the scripture, I mean, a theme, a common theme of the scripture from beginning to end is not to be caught up in the cares of this world, and the, the, the financial riches and wealth and the things of this world because we're not of this world. So we're not supposed to be living for those things and setting our heart on the things of the world because the things of the world are not of the Father. And we're not supposed to be covetous, so we're not supposed to be desiring those types of things that we don't have and setting our heart on, on the money and being greedy over stuff. So God's not going to be a partner to you just being sinful. James chapter 4, verse number 1 reads this, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. So first he's saying, look, you're not even asking for the things. You're fighting and warring over stuff, and you didn't even ask God. But then he says this, you ask and receive not, because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. He's saying, you know, first of all, you got to ask. Second of all, though, you're asking, you got to ask for the right thing. Because if you're asking about these things, you just want to consume it on your lusts. He's saying, he's not going to give you that either. Ask for something good. Ask for something holy. Ask for something righteous. Ask for something that's going to be according to God's will. That's how you're going to get your prayers answered. 
And before you start getting all huffy going, well, oh, man, I thought I said I could just ask for anything. And, you know, like, why do I have to ask for things according to God's will? Why wouldn't you want to ask for things according to God's will? Yeah, right. I mean, really take, take a thought on that. If you're asking for things that are not according to God's will, how in the world is that going to be good for you? Amen. I mean, your own self-preservation, don't you want what's good for you? Amen. Like, ultimately? And maybe you need to grow up spiritually a little bit, but it's kind of like the kids that don't want to eat their broccoli or their vegetables. I don't like the way it tastes. I don't want to have any of that. Why do parents make the kids eat their vegetables? Or at least why does it happen in my house? I can tell you that because maybe it doesn't happen everywhere. I make them eat their vegetables because it's good for them. Because they need it for their health. Because it's something that they need to, to just be healthy and they can't just live off of, you know, whatever. I don't know, ice cream, sugar, candy, whatever they would choose to have. No, you're going to eat what I give you, but you have to eat these things because it's good for you. It's in your best interest. And yeah, sometimes the things that are really in your best interest aren't the most fun or the most pleasing to the flesh even. May not be, right? But the spiritual things, the good things, the things that truly are good for you, the things that truly will bring peace and joy in your life aren't necessarily going to be the most exciting things in the world. Well, it could be, right? How are your, uh, what is it that you take interest in? What is it that you're really into, right? If you're into the things of God, then more and more these things become more exciting. But the more you're in the world, the less exciting the things of God are going to be to you. But either way, no matter where you're at on that spectrum, no matter how worldly you are or how spiritual you are, you ought to just take a step back and think like, am I asking for the right things? Because I want to ask for the things that God would have me to do because God loves you. <laughs> and he wants what's best for you, so you should be really trying to get in tune with what God wants for you because whatever it is, it's going to be the best thing in your life. Whatever he would have you do is exactly the best thing for you to do. So we really ought to be spending time thinking about that as well. And there's obvious, like in this case, there's some obvious things that you just shouldn't be asking for. Anymore. Anything that's just sinful, anything you're just going to consume on lust, like don't, don't waste your time asking for that stuff. Like my kids already even know better than to waste their time asking me for ridiculous things that like, of course you're not, I'm not going to let you do that. That's really bad for you. We need to get to that point too where we wouldn't ask for things that are just ridiculous. I mean, the Bible says there in the next verse, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. And we've covered that not that long ago, but still uh, it's important to understand that, you know, you'd be praying for your married, like, oh, I want to pray for a mistress. Yeah, no. <laughs> adulterers and adulteresses. Like, God, can you bring some... some <laughs> Some hot woman to be my, you know, like, what? God's going to be like, Psh, like, get out of here. <laughs> uh, flip over to 1 John chapter 5. So obviously we, we want to ask for the right things, okay? And that's, and that's kind of a big part of our prayers too, is asking for the right things. And knowing, knowing what that is. And sometimes there are situations where, I, I'm not saying it would be bad, like maybe, you, maybe you, you're in a financial crisis, right? And we all find ourselves in those from time to time, I'm sure, right? Like I, I know I do, and I'm sure you do too. Where you might think like, hey, the best thing for me is like if I could just come into some extra money and I could pay this thing off or, or get that thing or whatever it is where I'm in this, in this situation, we might think of that as being like, well, of course, that's the best option. But it's not always necessarily. It's not always the best. And, and I think a good way of, of understanding this and explaining this is, you know, the same way that I feel about helping people that come to our church that are in need, right? And they'll say, hey, I'm homeless or whatever, and this is going on in my life, and that's going on in my life, and I, and I need some money so I can get some food or get some place or whatever, well, you know, I, I actually do care about those people that come to our church. I do care about them. And, I, and you know what? I do want to help them. But they don't always want to receive the help that I'm going to give them. Because the help I'm going to give them is not 
necessarily just reaching in my pocket and throwing some cash in their hand and sending them on their way. Because for many of those situations, that doesn't really help them. It just continues their problem that they, they're going to continue to have in their life. So it's not even really a help. Now, in their mind, that's all they care about. And I can't tell you how many people I've said, like, I don't want any of that. I just want you to give me some money. To where they'll literally just come out and just say that. Like, I just, you know, I don't want any of that. Well, the money's not going to help you. Now, it's easier to see that when it's someone else, right? But we got to remember sometimes, sometimes it's us. And sometimes we dig ourselves into situations we might not even realize we dig ourselves into situations. God's going to say, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to leave you there a little bit. I'm not going to leave you alone, but I'm gonna, you know, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna work through this because it still might be a good way to learn and to grow and might be a place where you need to be and be a little bit hungry for a while or need, you know, to get into these situations where ultimately in the end it's going to be good and it's going to be valuable to you. Because we are not promised a cakewalk life through, <laughs> through this world of everything just being done for you. Like, you are just all that. Like, God broke the mold when he made you, and he's just going to make everything perfect for you. Like, no. No. You're going to have to go through some trials and tribulations. Look, and the more you're going to serve God, the more you can expect to go through trials and tribulations. And it's going to come in all different variety and shapes and forms. So... Of course, when we go through it, like the Apostle Paul said, hey, you know, for this thing, I, I besought the Lord thrice, like, like three times. I'm going to God. God, can you help me out here? And God said, you know, my grace is sufficient for thee. Yeah. Right? So he said, okay. Okay. God chose, now, and look, the Apostle Paul, if we're looking at people who are godly, we're looking at people who are serving the Lord and doing what's right, I mean, God's going to want to hear the Apostle Paul, of course. But if there's a better reason that God knows that's going to be according to his will, that it's better for Paul to not have that relief or have that answer to what he's specifically asking for, then we still need to keep that in mind and be like, at the end of the day, Lord, whatever I'm asking you for, you know a lot more than I do, so just your will be done. Amen. And, and keep that mindset, because that's gonna, that mindset's going to help you. Obviously, God already knows that. But it's going to help you to remember that so when you pray and you feel like maybe you're not being heard and maybe your prayer's not being answered, that God knows everything. We're just fully continuing to trust in him and say, okay, well, if this, if this doesn't happen the way that I'm asking for it, that I'm still going to trust that, that God knows and that, and that it will work out in the end and that he'll figure out a way to answer my prayer even if it's not exactly what I'm asking for. We have to ask things according to his will in order for him to hear us. What, did I have you turn to 1 John 5? Yes. Verse number 14, the Bible says, and this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, and that is a key phrase, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. God really wants to give. He's, he's in, in so many places, we see this, hey, ask you receive. We just have to do it the right way and ask for the right things. He wants what's best for you. Let's say it's ask for the things according to his will. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, you want wisdom? Yeah, God wants you to have wisdom. Yeah, ask for that. He'll give it to you liberally. Now, it doesn't mean that it's going to be like the Matrix. And he's just going to plug something back in your head. You're just going to be like, <laughs> and just be like, wow, I know everything. You know, it's, it's, he's going to do it in his timing, but he'll still open up your, your wisdom. I mean, there's been so many things that I know I prayed for, but I pray for understanding about different passages of scriptures and stuff, and it doesn't come necessarily right away. Sometimes, occasionally, I would say rarely, where I'll be praying about something, studying something, and then kind of get a, a real good grip and feel like, like God's opened up the scripture to me, like within that sitting. But usually, more often than not, it takes a little bit longer to, to really get a good understanding of what, of what it is that I'm, I'm asking for. But um, he'll do it according to his time. Now, when we ask, of course, we want to ask according to his will. Um, we also want to keep asking. And, and turn, if you would, to, uh, to Matthew chapter 6. Because I just want to be clear about this. When I say to, to keep asking, you know, the Apostle Paul asked three times for, for his uh, problem to be dealt with, to go away. 
We saw Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He prayed three times, right? That, that if it was possible that this, this cup's going to pass from him, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done, right? So Jesus was requesting that, hey, if there's any other way that I, can, that I can be the Savior of the world, that I can do everything that I need to do, that I can fulfill all of your will, Lord, Lord, like, like can, can we explore that option? Can we do that? But nevertheless, not according to my will, but thine be done. It is, at the end of the day, the most important thing is that, that everything that I'm doing is according to your will. Amen. And he besought him three times, right? So continuing to pray for things, especially things that are important to us, there's nothing wrong with that, and we ought to do that. Just as the, the church was praying for the apostle Peter when he was in prison, I think it's Acts 12, uh, and, and he, was, he was in prison, and that's the one where he's actually released from prison. Right? The church is praying at this house and they're all gathered together and they're praying for Peter, praying for Peter. And then he actually shows up and then they're kind of surprised at like, wait, what? What do you mean Peter's at the door? Like, this woman's crazy. It's like, and he keeps knocking and it's like, oh wait, Peter really is here, you know? I don't think they all necessarily believe that it was actually going to happen, but, you know, they, they did pray nonetheless and enough of them must have had faith because uh, the Lord freed him from that prison. But, my point is this, right? We, we want to be able to continue to go back to the Lord with our requests, but we don't want to get involved in mindless chanting either because that's not uh, biblical prayer either. So the Bible says in verse number 5 in Matthew chapter 6, And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily, I say unto you, they have their reward. So first, the first thing, and before we even get into the chanting thing, you know, if you're just praying so that people can hear you and people can hear what a great speaker you are or so that people can think, oh, what a godly person, and that's why you're praying. That's why they prayed out in public and prayed out in the streets was just so that they could be seen of men, just so people could have a positive view of them. If that's why you're praying, you already got your reward. Don't think that God's going to actually listen and answer your prayer if you're doing it pretentiously and you're doing it just for your own self-glorification in other people's eyes. Because God won't answer your prayers for that. He says, But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Now this isn't just a total slam of doing like group prayer or any type of public prayer. It has to do with your heart. right? So it has to do with the things that are, if you really want uh, something to come to pass, that you don't, just do it so that you can have other people hear you. It's, it, you should be able to do this with nobody hearing you because it's something that you want. You just pray to God and you know what? God will see you in secret and reward you openly. But then he goes on and continues to explain a little bit more. Verse seven, but when ye pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. And a perfect example of this would be like saying, 20 Hail Marys and six Our Fathers and whatever, right? That's chanting. That's vain repetition. That's just saying a bunch of words. I remember when I was younger, well before I was saved, going to Presbyterian church, and, and I wanted to pray to God, and I didn't know how to pray to God. Didn't know. And, and I had to memorize the Lord's Prayer because that's what we did in the Presbyterian church. You just memorize this thing. And I was like, okay, this is the Lord's Prayer. They had me memorize this. So I just start saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know, I just chanted this thing because I wanted to pray and I sincerely wanted to pray, but I didn't know what to do. So I'm just saying these words and you know what that was? It was vain. What do, what do you want, right? And, and, and here's the thing. And, and look, I'm not trying to make fun. If you don't know how to pray, I'm not trying to make fun of you here. Look, I was, I was in the same situation. Okay, but, but just don't make it too complicated. Praying, you're just talking to God. You're asking God for stuff. You're asking him. And what God really wants anyways is not some perfectly worded prayer he wants you praying from the heart. Amen. Just open up your heart to God and talk to him and, and ask for the things that you need and ask for the guidance and look to him and rely on him and, and, and have that open communication with the Lord from your heart. You don't have to say, thy will be done, like you're using this, you know, the, the, the language found in the King James Bible saying, thy and thee, like, you don't talk that way, you don't have to. Now, if you do, I don't care, like, it doesn't matter but don't try to have to use some extra terminology that's like you think it's spiritual or something. 
Just talk to God and, and open up your heart to him. That's what he wants to see. You don't have to be pretentious. And don't, and not the vain repetition. See, not all repetition is vain. So like if you have a request and it's not being met and you want to keep asking for the same thing just in general, like Jesus, he took a break each time he prayed. He wasn't just going, dear Lord, please help me with this. Lord, Lord please help me with this. Lord, please, you know, like just, just saying the same words over and over and over again, like he's chanting. But he did go back and, and make his request. Took a break, go back, made a request. Took a break, go back, made a request. And that is not a vain repetition. You see the difference, though. I mean, it's, it should be pretty clear. You know, most of this stuff is meant to be pretty obvious. Um, you know, the heathen, they think they're going to be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. And this says, after this manner, therefore, pray ye. And this is where you get the Our Father, which art in heaven, held by the name. But this is said, after this manner. He didn't say, repeat these. He just said, don't use vain repetitions. So let's just repeat this. No, <laughs> It's after this manner. It's in this way, in this format is how you do it. So what do we see in this format? Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So we see reverence and respect in addressing the Lord appropriate. Amen. Right off the bat, in humility, God, you're in heaven and your name is hallowed. You're holy. Thy kingdom come, look, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. So what are we interested in right off the bat? I want your will to be done. So I'm going to ask you for something, but before I even ask, God, I just want to make sure that we're clear, that you understand, I do want your will to be done. So I'm going to you in prayer, humbly showing respect and with the, with the intention that your will would be done. Give us this day our daily bread, asking God, hey, can you just take care of me today, please? Not asking to store up a whole bunch of food and everything else in a big storehouse for the future, but can you please feed me today? And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Hey, we're, we're sinful. I'm sinful, Lord. Please, please show mercy on me. Please have, show me forgiveness. Because you know what, God? I, I do that to other people. I, I'm showing forgiveness. I'm showing mercy to other people. So please extend that to me. And this is a big part, by the way. I mentioned this at the beginning of the sermon. I'm gonna, it's going to come up again in a little while. How you deal with other people is also going to play an impact on your prayers getting answered. Think about it this way. You may, without even knowing it, be in a position to answer someone else's prayers. You may find yourself somehow to be able to answer someone else's prayer, some, some brother or sister's in need at some point and you're in a position to take care of them, but then you just don't want to deal with it all and you want to have nothing to do with it and you just kind of give the cold shoulder and brush it away. But then you have a need one day. And God's going to remember, you know what? Hey, when, when you had that opportunity to help and be an answer to prayer for someone else, you didn't want have anything to do with it. And, and now look, the tables have turned and you're in this situation. And this is, this is a consistent teaching just throughout Scripture. And I would admonish you, you know, to get your prayers answered, that you ought to live a life as if you're going to be answering other people's prayers, even if you don't know it. Right? How about, hey, you live close to this person. It's my friend. Can you go preach the gospel to him, please? Well, then how about when you're praying for your loved ones, your family members to get saved? You know, like, hey, I did this for them. Or, you know, I mean, there's so many things that you can just, just come up with where you put yourself in the same situation. I've got this, this need. I've got that need. I, you know, whatever it is. And then you shut up your bowels of compassion towards them, like the Bible talks about. Look, don't do that. You know, people do you wrong, forgive them. And God will treat you similarly. So he says, give us, uh, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. Keep us safe. We don't, we don't want to be tempted and tested and tried. You know, like, like God, please just help us to, to go about our, our business and, and, and do, our, do our work uh, and keep us from harm, from evil, from people committing violence against us. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So 
This is a sample prayer. And then verse 14 says, For if you forgive men their trespasses, your, father, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Again, to the same type of thinking, the same mindset, sometimes we're going to be going to God in prayer, asking him to show mercy on us, right? Asking him to forgive us. Lord, I screwed up, God. I'm sorry. Now, hopefully we're doing that all the time as often as we're sinning and just having a humble, but, but being sincere, not just saying, oh, I better cover my butt now and make sure I say a prayer. That's not going to get you anywhere. You need to have a, a, a good repentant heart with the Lord for, to, to even receive that mercy. But not just that, you also need to be exhibiting that as well in your life so that God can see, oh, okay, yeah, you know what? You're, you're doing things right here, so I will extend the mercy. And it's another way for God to hear you and answer your prayers when you want him answered is you're doing right. You're having the right attitude. Turn, if you would, to, um, oh, let's see, where did I leave off? First John chapter 3. Just keeping his commandments, being obedient, is going to be another way that's going to help your prayers to be heard and answered. And, and this, again, just makes perfect logical sense. If you think about it in terms of, of a father with his children, right? When your kids ask you for something, if they've just been disobedient and rebellious and stubborn like all day long or all week long and then they want something from you, I mean, how many dads in here are going to be like, yeah, sure, okay, I'll get that for you? know, like, of course not. You're like, no. Why, why do you expect me to do anything for you You've been disrespectful. You haven't done anything I told you to do. You're not listening to me, but you want me to listen to you? God's going to treat us the same way. God's like, look, I, I have commandments for you. I expect you to follow these things. I've got, I've, I gave you my word. And if you really do love me and respect me, you're going you're to take my word, you're going to receive my word, and you're going to listen to it and, and do it. So when we are not obeying his commandments... Why in the world is he going to want to listen to us? We're not listening to him. You expect him to listen to you? 1 John 3, verse 21, the Bible says, Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then we have, have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So think about this. God's going to be in a much better mood if you're being obedient. Being like, God, look, I'm doing this, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. Everything you're telling me to do, Lord, I'm doing and think about that with their children too. Hey, I'm doing everything right. Dad, I got my school all done in time. My room's clean. The chores are done. I've been doing everything you've asked me to do all week. Can we go get some ice cream? A lot more likely to give the blessing on the, the request that's being made in that circumstance than the other. I'll just read this for you. You don't have to turn it. Turn if you go to Isaiah chapter 1. Psalm 66, verse number 18, reads this. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. If I regard iniquity in my heart, meaning that like, regarding iniquity in your heart is, is meaning like you're, you're not repenting of it. You're not, you're not like going, oh, wait, iniquity, I don't have nothing to do with that. You're like holding on to it, right? You're, you're, you're showing regard for sin, in your heart, like you're, you're, you're holding some secret sin inside of you going, I really like this sin. And if you have that attitude toward the sin and you're just like, no, I'm just going to, I'm just going to hold on to this. And, and I like this sin and I want to keep doing this sin and I'm going to just, just, well, the Lord's not going to hear you. We need to have a, a, a heart that's saying, I don't want to sin. Proverbs 28, 9 reads, He that turneth away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer shall be abomination. So you don't want to hear God's law? Oh, we're going to the Old Testament again. Oh, we're reading God's law. You don't want to hear God's law? Well, even his prayer shall be abomination. I mean, again, you don't want to listen to God? He doesn't want to listen to you. And abomination is a pretty strong word. I mean, God has strong hatred for that prayer that comes in from the person that just doesn't want to have anything to do with God's rules and God's laws. So you want to get your prayers answered? Yeah, you know, you ought to 
you ought to look to the law of the Lord and, and be mindful in following his rules for you. Isaiah chapter 1, verse number 11. We see just a little bit more fleshing out of this scenario uh, with this whole people here um, that are completely just in sin, yet they still want to bring things before God. Look at verse number 11. The Bible reads, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me? said the Lord. I am full of the burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. You say, well, I thought he told the people to do all these things. He did. He did. So what they're doing is they're bringing the burnt offerings. They're bringing the rams. They're bringing the bullocks. They're, they're having these feasts and the new moons and the Sabbaths as was commanded. But he's saying it's iniquity. For them. Let's keep reading. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when ye spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when ye make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. And see, that's the real problem right there. They're going to come and play like they're so spiritual. And look, God, we got our sacrifice. And look, God, we're going to come to this feast. And look, God, you know, I'm going to pray to you. And, and your hands are full of blood. You're wicked. He's like, I don't want to hear any of this stuff. It makes him sick when you've got this hypocritical, extremely wicked people coming and playing church and thinking that they're going to be all right with God because they did this and did this and then this. It's like, no, your heart is so far removed from the Lord. You're full of wickedness. He says, wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. Like, that's what I want you doing. I want you doing righteousness. I want you, I want your heart right I don't want you doing all this garbage and this sinful life and then just coming and be like, oh, okay, yes, I'm going to offer a sacrifice and I'm just going to you know, pray to the Lord and we're going to have our feasts and everything's going to be good. No. No. Of course, these were commandments of them to follow, but it does them no good whatsoever when their heart is not right with God. I mean, in fact, it, it, it's, it's worse. It's worse. Because it just angers God that much more. I mentioned this already, but I'm going to read it. Turn if you go to Luke chapter 6. About treating other people having a big impact on your prayers. Actually, you know what? Just go ahead and turn to 1 Peter chapter 3. Sorry, just, just, go, just go to keep going forward to 1 Peter chapter 3. I'll read this for you. It's very similar to what we already read in Matthew 7. It's kind of the, the same, the, the similar parallel passage from, from Matthew 7. Luke 6, 31 says, And as ye would that men should do to you, do ye also to them likewise. Right? There's that, that, that golden rule principle of, hey, treat people the way you want to be treated. And then a little bit further down in the passage, verse 37, it says, Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Given, it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet, with all it shall be measured to you again. Just, just more passages about, look, the way that you live your life, the way that you help other people, that's going to come back on you. And God will see these things, and it comes into consideration when you ask him for help and you ask him for things. He sees how you're living your life. He sees where your heart is. He sees how much you're trying to serve him and trying to do and trying to love your brother. And, try, you know, and all of these things matter when you ask for things. They matter. You want your prayers answered and heard, then, then look. Especially in your time when you don't have a need. Don't get so full of yourself that you can't help anyone else. 
Because then when you come to your time of need and you start asking for things, you might be hard-pressed to find it. 1 Peter chapter 3, along these same lines, verse number 7 reads, Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, and as being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. And this is, this is spoken to husbands. Now, of course, preceding this was, was for the wives to, to love their husbands and to be obedient unto them. But specifically, though, about the prayers not being hindered was spoken to the husbands. Look, you don't want your prayers hindered? Then you need to dwell with your wives according to knowledge and that you give honor unto the wife. And, you know, people that want to teach that, oh, you know, the fundamentalist Christian women are so oppressed and everything else. And it's like, look, no, we believe in the, in the roles that God has placed on men and women. Amen. And they're different jobs because men and women are different. And there's only men and only women. And that's it. Yes. And they are very different from one another. Thank God. We ought to be rejoicing in the fact that men and women are different and they're not the same and don't, shouldn't have the same jobs. They're completely different from one another. But the, the, the Christian ought to give honor unto his wife. She's not your slave. You have authority over your wife. That's God-given. Yes. But you still honor your wife and you love her the way that Christ loved the church. It's a self-sacrificial love. It's, it's one where you're going to put yourself out there to help and protect your wife and your family and your children, right? And you're going to take the brunt of everything that's hard. You're going to be the rock. You're going to be solid. And you're going to give honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel and understanding that, yes, you know what, ladies? You're weaker. You are the weaker vessel. You're physically weaker than men. <gasps> 2024, shocker, right? Shocking news report. A pastor in a Baptist church just said that men are stronger than women. <laughs> get the social justice warriors out here and get that man canceled. <laughs> this is craziness. But look, this is what the scripture says. So, so, but, but seriously now, we do have to understand that, that women are the weaker vessels. So we give honor unto that and, and, and understand that and have proper expectations. And look at this, and as being heirs together of the grace of life. So while you are in charge, don't ever forget you're heirs together. You're on equal standing in the kingdom of God. You're in charge as far as, as things related to making decisions and being an authority. Yes, but don't ever forget that your wife is on equal standing with you. You're both inheritors of God's grace and of the kingdom of God. Because in Christ, there's neither male nor female. So once we're done here till death do us part, you're no longer married. So when you get to the kingdom of God, you're brother and sister. So... How you dwell with your wife according to knowledge, it matters. Amen. Honor your wife. She's the weaker vessel. But in all of that said, that your prayers be not hindered. You want your prayers answered? Okay, then live properly. And yes, you know, the authority is there. 100% it's there. But but your wife is not a lesser person. <laughs> She's just a subordinate in, in authority. Verse 8, Finally, be ye all of one mind, having compassion one of another. Love is brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrarywise blessing, knowing that ye are thereunto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. For he that will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, look at this, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. One more place where we could just see, hey, look, do righteously, obey God's commandments, do what's right, have this mindset of everything preceding that we just read. And God's ears are going to be open to your prayers. Amen. It's going to help you get your prayers answered by living righteously, 
loving life, seeing good days, refraining your tongue from evil, how you communicate, your lips that aren't speaking guile, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, being above that, living above reproach. All right, James chapter 5 is the last place we're going to turn to. I had one more point, but I'm just going to skip that when it comes to uh, praying and being heard. I had a whole point on fasting, but it's kind of its own sermon anyways. I preached on this in the past. So I'll just mention it now that fasting is another element to add to prayer when we pray to God that um, you know, can, can help you get your prayers heard. And, and that's going to be for, for more serious situations. It's not something that you probably would just be doing as regularly. We see in Scripture people who are praying uh, and fasting. It's, it's also oftentimes uh, tied in with, with uh, sackcloth and ashes and people really humbling themselves and really in dire situations, like very serious, maybe life or death situations where they're going to proclaim a fast and they're going to you know, afflict their soul and humble themselves immensely and just be really focused and dedicated on praying to God, okay? Um, but again, I, I have, there's more verses. I, I'm not going to turn to all those. We, we simply just don't have the time to go through all that tonight. Um, but just something to be mindful of as I'm trying to be comprehensive about our prayer life here. James chapter 5, we'll close in James chapter 5, verse number 14. Bible reads, Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And this is a little bit of a special situation. Again, talking about calling the elders of the church to pray over someone, that's not like, hey, I've got the flu. Can you come and anoint me with oil? All right, and you're calling the elders of the church up to come on over to your house and anoint you with oil. That's a much more serious situation um, in general. And it says here, in the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord shall raise him up. And if you have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. And um, of course, I do believe that uh, having faith in your prayers and having, you know, being anointed with oil is, is, is something that's referenced here in Scripture of something that you can do if, you're, if you are saved. But it also references, um, you know, people's sins being forgiven. And again, in the context, I think this isn't just talking about people just getting, um, just getting saved but people who might have done wrong and found themselves in a situation, right? Because look, when we sin, we could, we could bring illness and sickness on ourselves. That's a punishment from God, a chastisement, right? And when you humble yourself, God can heal that sickness. So of course, you know, we could, we could pray for people, preach people the gospel. Like I don't think this is talking about though unsaved people just getting saved by having anointing oil you know, over them while they pray. This is talking about people who have called for the elders of their church, they're going to church, and um, they have some, some serious problem and um, getting, you know, being forgiven. Why? Because they're humble. Why? Because they're seeking the Lord. Why? Because they're seeking for God. And, you know, and this would, this would relate to other passages where we see some of the kings that have been afflicted with a disease, right? And then, like, they choose maybe not to seek the Lord. Well, guess what? They die of that disease. They seek the doctors. They don't seek the Lord. It's like the, in the past, they had faith. Clearly, they had faith. They trusted in the Lord to win their battles for them. They did a lot of great things for God. But then later on in their life, you know, they just kind of disregard the Lord. They get a disease. And then, you know, I think Asa was one of them. Disease in his feet, right? And then he ends up, that just stays with him. Didn't seek to God. Could have, but he didn't, right? Whereas I think that, that he was afflicted purposely uh, because of his straying from the Lord. But if he would have followed the wisdom that we see in James, James chapter 4 and called for the priest and said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm sick. I'm going to seek the Lord. I need healing from God. Then um, it could have turned out different for him. But he would have to be humble. He'd have to admit his wrongdoing and, and be repentant of, of his sin because then, um, like it says here, if you have committed sins, okay, God will forgive them then. Verse 16, though, continues on about prayer. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. Now, again, confessing your faults one to another is not like the, the Catholic confessional booth right. where you're just going to list off all your sins to people. 
your faults. I mean, think about that just alone. Oh, well, if you say, my fault, right? My bad. You did something wrong to someone. So you're going to confess your faults to people that you've done wrong to. So it's an apology to sorry, right? I did wrong here. And you confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Because when people are just in extreme error and they don't want to admit it and they have a stiff neck, that's when God's going to chastise and punish. Right? So we humble ourselves and pray for one another and, and um, confess your faults one to another, then you'll be healed, the Bible reads. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, which is another reason why we pray and why you ought to pray. The effectual effectual, that means it's taking effect, right? What you're asking is actually pretty good. And why is it? Well, you've got fervent prayer. It's heartfelt. You mean it. It's sincere. It's from the heart. It's righteous. It's from a righteous man. He's listening to God. He's keeping God's commandments. And you're going to avail much. And then it brings us the example here. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And look at that. He had to pray in faith because if you're asking for weather control, like, look, man's been trying that for a long time and they still don't got it down, right? They may be doing this uh, geoengineering and trying to, to spawn clouds and all this other stuff, but he's asking for God to make it not rain at all. Like, man does not have that power. But you know what? He's fully confident God could do this. God could do this. So he's praying earnestly that it might not rain. And you know what it says? And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and three and a half years of no rain. That's a long time. I mean, I, I moved here from Arizona and there's lots and lots and lots of days of no rain, but it's never gone three and a half years since I ever lived there. That's a really long time. But for God, nothing. And even Elisha's here is able to just go, yep, or Elijah was able to just say, yeah, it's, uh, I'm just going to pray to God for this. And he did. And he's a righteous man. And he's, and he's praying righteously. And the whole point of this was to bring the judgment on, what, Ahab, right? And, and Jezebel. Jezebel, right? Ahab's wife. And they, um, you know, there's, there's a good reason for it. And God heard him and he listened to him. And I believe that's something that Elijah came up with, like, hey, you know what, God, can you just make it not rain? God answered him. Sure can. And then in verse 18 says, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Now, I just want to close with verse 17 again. It says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. Elijah's a hero of the faith, man. We, love it. we read all these stories about him, but you know what? He was just a man. Just a man like you and me, unless you're a woman. <laughs> <laughs> but he's a person. He's a human being. Okay? And, and look, we all, we all have the flesh. We all have to deal with this. But there are some people who are honored in the Scripture that are putting away the flesh a lot and are walking the spirit a lot more and are doing things in faith and, and, are, and are doing things according to God's will and, and, they're, and they're asking for things and they're trusting God and they're completely trusting him with all their heart. And then when they ask the hard things like, hey, could you make it not rain for a while? God's like, done. You got favor with God. Why? Because he's listening to him. He's asking for the right things. He's completely asking in faith. No matter how hard it is, he knows that God can do it. He's doing all the right things to get his prayer heard, to get his prayer answered. So we all, ha we all, all have areas of things that God can help us in. So hopefully you can take heed to, to some of the things. Maybe, maybe, maybe you've already known all of these things, but you know what? You're... you're seeing an area of your life where you're going, you know what, though, I think I'm a little bit out of bounds on this, and this is going to be preventing me from getting my prayers answered, so fix it, right? And there's no new content in here for me, but it's still stuff that I need to be refreshing my mind all the time about.
and be like, yeah, you know what? I'm not doing that as good as I ought to be. So let's, uh, let's, let's take the word, let's receive God's word, but don't just walk out of here as a forgetful hearer and just do nothing about it. I think we could all improve our prayer life. So let's, let's apply it. Put it into place. Put it into practice. Don't be the hypocrite. And then just turn to God every time you have a problem and not wanting to help anyone else out when they have a problem. Let's bow our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, thank you so much for the wisdom in your word. And thank you for hearing us. We thank you for giving us those great words of promise that, that you know, we ask and, and, and we'll receive and that you love us so much, Lord, that you're willing to hear us. And, and even though we may sometimes ask for foolish things, dear God, we, we thank you for just being there for us and instructing us. I pray that you please help us to have better discernment and more wisdom that we can not ask for foolish things, Lord, and that um, you would just continue to teach us to, to be more in accordance with your will and to be always mindful of what your will may be that, um, that we can serve you most effectively. We know that we are and were created for your pleasure. And uh, we're here to serve you, dear Lord. We're here to, to spread the truth. And I pray that you would just work with our church. Help us in, in, in all of our needs, dear Lord. We love you. We're relying on you. We know you're all powerful. And we're going to completely trust in you uh, to help us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.